What's up everyone? Another exciting interview here today. Today we have Mariana Krim. She's SVP of blockchain at Vivo Smart Chain, also known as VSC. VSC is a HealthFi ecosystem that promotes healthy life choices with anonymous health data monetization. 500,000 users and growing. Mariana previously worked with Waze and Spotify. All right, so before we kick it off and, and start discussing you know, crypto marketing. Walk us through your background a little bit. Um, I come from the communications industry. I mostly worked with Silicon Valley companies in the phase, in the early stages of their growth in emerging markets. So that's my background. And since DeFi summer, I started my journey in crypto and decentralized finance in 2020. And that's how I joined BSC to, to build an ecosystem that connects people to the data that they own with the market. So it's been a long journey, but it's been always learning. Yeah. Yeah. I love how you say you got in during DeFi summer. It's like, it's one of the only industries that like, like a six month period, it could be like a whole time period that has a name in the web three space. I want to walk through a couple things. First, I want to go through how you got into crypto. And then I want to hear a whole bunch about PSC and, and the marketing side of that. So to start with, you know, what I guess got you into crypto in the first place? I think it was almost by accident, honestly, uh, because it was in a moment that I was uh, seeking to understand new forms of technology and forms of uh, uh, cultural movements that form and then uh, dictate a new industry. And I have always been very uh, much seeking for uh, products like that since the beginning. Uh, when I worked with Waze, for example, it was a different technology that eventually created the way people drive to places today. So uh, crypto didn't so much call my attention because of uh, the price appreciation standpoint, but mostly because of the community that forms and the participation of the community that makes this uh, a machine that ends up becoming a new economy. So I started to study, uh, got involved in tons of Discord channels uh, and Discord servers and uh, made tons of friends. And uh, that's how it, it becomes a rabbit hole. I don't know if it happened to you, but when you enter it, you go oh, yeah. deeper and deeper and deeper and there's so many different layers and then it eats you up and you end up spending 90% of your time on that. So uh, that's how I ended up uh, on... Um, crypto, but mostly on Web3 and DeFi. Yeah, it's a rabbit hole that has multiple rabbit holes within it. And there's more and more that get added every year, like between like NFTs and DeFi, they're all like we call it one industry, Web3 or, or crypto, but there's so many now between all of them. I, I remember when it was a lot simpler. Also, I, I want to hear more about Viva. I want to hear like about your role specifically and you know what it is. Really. So Vivo uh, is a, is a the health fight ecosystem. It was born from a need of wearable devices to collect data in a way that uh, the owner of the data can have control of it. So uh, Vivo initially it was a company focused on uh, wearable technology. And there are many products that are very interesting and uh, work very well. This is where the 500,000 people today are uh, participating in the ecosystem because they wear the wearable technology and they uh, get all the good stuff that any any wearable technology that tracks your health uh, will give you in terms of suggestions on how to be healthier and things like that. But a big problem that the industry had is this data uh, today, or the majority of the time, is being farmed from the users and there's no real uh, participation in the users in the value of the data or even ownership of this data. So VSC was born to solve uh, the issue of ownership of that and the way it's being managed uh, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a way that it could be decentralized, that it could be more uh, uh, democratic and give the owners of the data the actual control and the decision making. So. That's how a uh, blockchain technology today was applied to a company that was a wearable device company and together it becomes a new community and it forms a new economy. So as you know, we were just talking about DeFi and Web3. This is the whole idea about everything with DeFi and Web3, right? Forming a community that owns the decision and uh, where they're going and they have to learn how to regulate uh, themselves in a way that is fair for everyone. So it, it came from this feeling of giving people the real ownership of 
what's rightfully theirs and, and, and partake in the process of management of the data. With Vivo, is there a Vivo specific device or is it integrated with other wearables? So when it started, uh, Vivo has its own uh, line of wearable devices that uh, are have proprietary uh, technology that allows users to already choose whether or not they want to share this data. And the next step, which is where we are today, is when you open uh, the blockchain and the layer one to any device that could be connected. So it started in a controlled environment uh, with a smaller amount of uh, devices and uh, we grew over time. And now is uh, the time that we are ready to do the expansion to every device that is uh, compatible to the blockchain. And that's what we're working on in opening the gate for anybody who has any device to do the same thing that the people who are part of the Vivo ecosystem are already doing. Okay. So I have a Fitbit, we've been wearing it now. I've been wearing this for years. I really like it. Is the idea that I will, with my Fitbit, be able to start earning money based on the fact that I'm sharing the data that is being generated by the device? So there's a, we publish on the website, a list of 300 brands that are uh, compatible to us. Very big names uh, are there and um, a Fitbit specifically is not in the list. There are many other brands that are very big that are part of uh, the list that could be directly connected. So uh, yes, that is the, the, the plan that anybody who is wearing any device, they don't have to purchase a specific device for that. Through a data NFT, they can connect their device and start managing their data ownership and uh, uh, receive rewards for sharing the data. And what are the rewards, like in form of what? Is it a, a token? Is it cash? What does that look like? So VSC is the native coin of the ecosystem. It's the coin that's used to pay for gas fees. It's the coin that's used to uh, uh, to purchase the, the data NFT. And it's also the coin that's used to provide rewards to the users. It's the, the native uh, utility token. And then yeah. um, today it's a, it's, a, it's a coin that's already listed so that people can cash out at any time. Can you give me an idea of like, how like much people are earning right now? Or in the past, it depends on how much they wear the device, and uh, there are different there are different levels of NFTs that will allow you to collect more or less data depending on the frequency that it's measured. But um, what I think it's important here is that this is not just about rewarding people for the data that they share. It's about shielding the data from their personal information that will never be part of any. Uh, package that any data buyer can purchase in the future. Because I think the main problem today we're trying to solve is uh, the, the wearable data uh, information today is being sold by um, uh, brokers and the personal data of the people is part of the package. So if you think of it in the future, you could have, for example, a mortgage denied because you have a heart condition, right? And this is not something that should ever be disclosed uh, in your in your data, especially shouldn't be sold uh, to financial institutions. So this is uh, what we're trying to do is remove completely the personal information of the user from this data package. Uh, but how much they can make depends on the type of data, depends on the demand uh, that data is coming in the future. But what we're doing is we're tokenizing users data so that this can be bought from data buyers uh, in a way that doesn't include the personal information. The, the second component that I also think it's important is we use the, the, the blockchain uh, technology to do the verification and the confirmation and this data comes from a specific and a real biosensor because it's the second biggest problem of the data industry today. You don't know if this data was altered, if it was recreated, it's impossible to verify. And usually it takes a big uh, auditing uh, system after it's bought to make sure that it's correct. So blockchain technology solves that issue. And this also increases the value of the data uh, from the, the data buyer in the, in the future because it's already verified. It doesn't require an auditing. Um, so it's part of the, 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 the equation that's going to vary over time. Uh, today, it depends. It depends on the type of NFT and the amount of data. If you wear the watch 100% of the time uh, and it's collecting all of the time, you, you can uh, get more. But the amount you get is a specific amount per data block that's created in the blockchain. 
I see. So it's, the data is still being sold, but it's being sold in a more personally, you know, data safe way and, and, and conscious way and more of a consenting opt-in type format. Is that right? Always needs to be opted in. I see. Yeah. Otherwise it, it wouldn't. So when the user, uh, uh, for example, connects the data NFT and starts mining with their data, that's uh, when this data is being collected and they receive rewards for the data that's being generated. This data is forming a, a, a a data bank and uh, our next, one of the next steps in the future is we're going to uh, make this available for data buyers and they would also use uh, VSC for that. And that's when they're going to start acquiring the data. So today we're in the moment that we're still forming the database. I want to talk a little bit more about like your role specifically at Vivo. What does your day to day look like? What are the like main initiatives that you work towards? Mostly about growing the community and marketing efforts go to market. So we have been working a lot in building a new website that has entry points for the different type of stakeholders that interact with us. So we have a specific area for staking. So defining uh, the staking uh, offer and what are the requirements and then we have a specific area for data buyers a specific area for data uh, owners so defining all these different policies and narratives and entry points this is mostly what i do on a day-to-day -day basis and pr and marketing efforts anything related to increasing the community i'm also uh, on discord 24 7 and uh, on telegram uh, one of the moderators so it's, it's the facing with the community and the, the, the content that we create. It's quite a lot. sounds like. How big is your team? It's not just me, right? We have a spectacular team of uh, professionals that are, uh, that, that I'm very lucky to work with and, uh, they're, they're making big moves and, uh, on, on an everyday basis. We also have uh, teams in Asia. Uh, Asia is where the majority of our users are today. So we, we have teams in different countries and uh, speaking different languages to expand the community. Because at the end of the day, the way we're going to expand depends on where there's traction, right? We don't try to grow a specific area beforehand. We see where there's traction and that's when we invest in growing and building content and making it bigger as the traction happens. This is something that I learned very much on Waze, for example, right? You don't try to build a community. When it gets traction, then you give support to it and then it grows by itself. So that's how we have been rolling. Yeah, that was, once you said that, you know, the, the traction is in the Asian market, I was curious if that was a like concerted effort or if that was just something that developed organically and then you kind of put some fuel on it but it sounds like it was the latter. Why do you think Asia has been a source of, or an area of success for you? It really is very country-based, right? It, it depends a lot on the country, but uh, uh, people in Asia are very much uh, welcoming to health technology. They love their gadgets and they love to track uh, everything. And they're very, it's, they're very early adopters of new technologies uh, when it comes to their health. So I think it was a very easy path for us to grow naturally in an environment where this is something that's a daily concern um, for, for, for their culture. So uh, countries like Japan, for example, we have huge community, Taiwan, huge community. So these are natural places where it was uh, easy to grow because it's yeah. part of their daily culture. It, yeah, it's honestly not so very surprising to me at all that that's the area that you're having success because in the in the time that we've been running Coinbound, we've seen obviously a ton of of different Web three type you know initiatives, whether it's HealthFi or Play to Earn or things like that. And both like the HealthFi space, anything you're monetizing your data or activity, the Play to Earn sector, all of which we see way lower cost for acquisition in the Asian markets, and just a little bit faster organic growth. It's an interesting market for, for companies that are in that space. Um, on the topic of the many rabbit holes of crypto and Web3, HealthFi is one of them that is, you know, maybe two years old at this point. What is kind of going on in that space? Did it see as much of a decline as, like, say, the NFT market over the past two years? What is kind of the vibe in the HealthFi space? It's very much starting. We, we don't see a decline at all because uh, this is the phase where it's uh, incubated and starting to grow. So... I'm not saying that it cannot outstand uh, a bear market. It's just that it's not there yet. We're so early stage 
with health fi and uh, the 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 preoccupation with health is already part of people's day to day so i only see opportunity to grow from where we are today if you think of the users of wearable devices that track health this is a huge uh, size of a possible audience right your attainable audience is 1.1 uh, trillion devices. It's a huge audience that you could potentially accomplish regardless of them being interested in monetizing their data or not. Maybe they're interested in protecting it or maybe they're interested in uh, creating a new economy that protects the privacy. So everybody wants to protect their privacy when it comes to health data. And to me, this is a segment that's only going to grow. It's still very small in comparison to where it wants to go, right? Why do you think, and honestly, I'm going to ask you definitely to speculate here because it's not even specific to the health fi space, but we've seen, especially in the Web3 space, this thought process of it's time for people to start making money off of their data and be compensated for the data that they share and the value that, you know, essentially they create for either advertisers or just technology companies. Why do you think it hasn't happened yet in the health space? Why is there not, why is Fitbit not offered a, a solution to monetize the data they share? I don't know that I would speculate specifically on, on Fitbit. Obviously, Fitbit is owned by a big tech company who uh, uh, a part of their revenue is directly related to data. I, I think users don't mind sharing their data as long as they can take part on the value of it. And unfortunately, the majority of this data has been shared in a way that users are not aware. And uh, this is what, where I feel that this is going to grow a lot more. The users, either they're not aware or they're not realizing right, that they're sharing. And if they realize that they're sharing, it's not like they have a choice not to, because this choice is not available to them. So that when I tell you that I think this is going to grow, it's exactly because of that. It's giving people the choice to take a different path. And people don't mind sharing as long as they know and as long as they agree with the terms, right? So the, the terms need to be defined. That's why I think the majority of the, the data today is not uh, being managed in a way that users take part because it, 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 would, it would hurt the profits of the big companies that own uh, these devices. Yeah, I wonder, I, I suppose that does make sense because I know like Twitter has discussed adding, you know, some kind of component for financially compensating content creators, YouTube, kind of the same, but it's been much slower than I, I honestly would expect. I, to me, it's kind of a no-brainer that if you're going to pay people to make good content and get a lot of people to come to your platform, they should be compensated in some way, shape, or form. If I'm going to speculate, I happen to think the, the primary reason is that it's not a system that really exists so much yet. There's not a whole lot of places where that's like the, the model. And because of that, people aren't really asking for it. But I think when people open up to that kind of value chain, it's going to become really popular really fast. So I'm with you on that. If you think about it, tokenizing everything that has to do with you, not tokenizing to sell, tokenizing to give you ownership. Okay. So if I tokenize my eyeballs when I'm seeing an ad and I have the right to receive or to partake in rewards because I saw the ad, I'm tokenizing my data anyway, right? Why can this not be done? It can because uh, NFT technology is what uh, would make it viable today. I think the problem is that maybe our industry in crypto uh, use NFT technology in a way that is so not what it's supposed to be because it's still uh, understanding its ways and it's still growing, right? That a, a lot of people are um, don't trust uh, the NFT technology yet or think it has to do with the JPEGs that are going to grow in price. And that's really not what it is, right? It's just giving ownership. So the technology exists to me. Um, NFTs are the technology that would allow you to have full ownership of anything that has to do with you. And it allows you to uh, control, decide whether you want to share or not. And it allows you to tokenize that. So to me and to, to the company, that's what we see as a future is people owning uh, the tokenization of anything that has to do with them and taking part of the value of it, hmm. be able to make decisions whether they want to share or not. So uh, I think it exists. It's just that it's not being used yet, but it exists. Yeah, it doesn't, from a tech standpoint, it doesn't sound super difficult, especially with the advent of, of 
you know, blockchain tech, it seems to just be like kind of a consumers don't think to ask to be compensated for sharing their data. And that's why they don't get it. I want to discuss the marketing piece. You mentioned before, there's a lot that goes into your day to day. As far as marketing tasks, what do you think has been the most impactful for you or the, the most successful strategy or tactic that you've used? You see, to, to, to me, having a clear channel of feedback from the community the whole time not a community as a bunch of people who participate on Discord. No, the people who use your product, if they can give you direct feedback fast enough and you can react to it and shape your product or your offer or your technology in a way that fulfills the utility that your users need, that's what traction is. And we have that's why we started so controlled in the beginning, right? Uh, so the more uh, interactions we have with the community where we see valuable feedback, that is a factor of success to us because we have been able to change product time and time again and even change priorities of the development in our roadmap based on the needs that have been reported by the community. And nobody knows better your product than the ones that are using it every day. So, uh, and, and I think a lot of uh, companies or products, maybe they don't look at it this way because it's also hard to have a scaled solution to receive direct feedback like that. But if you have a community that engages a lot, you're able to gather valuable insights about your product that you can uh, react very fast and change it and tailor to what they need. So and this is a big factor of success to us. Yeah, you bring up an interesting point that I don't think enough people in the Web3 space understand, which is that the feedback that you get, everyone says, you know, community feedback is important. It, it's not, you know, a groundbreaking idea, but the the way you gather feedback and the way you act on it is something that's a little bit more like proprietary to every marketing team. And I find it's very, very common for people to create like a Telegram or a Discord and treat every bit of feedback from every type of person as equal when it's really not. Someone who's who's just joining your, your Discord or Telegram because they think the value of something that you've created is going to go up and they're trying to speculate is totally different. And in my opinion, way less valuable than someone that actually uses the product. And companies that create these systems that are able to differentiate that and kind of tune out the noise of people that aren't really, you know, not not like, that are more like sta stakeholders in the actual success of a product or the underlying business model should be counted way more. I I'm curious what systems you've put in place, if any, to gather that feedback. Like what softwares have you used? What does that process look like for you? So we have the moderators that are in the chat, but we also have the co-founders uh, disguised as uh, moderators the whole time. So I spend most of my nights and Fabio too. In, in the community, listening and responding and uh, gathering everything that we can possibly absorb that could make the product better, we gather from uh, these places. So Discord specifically is a place where it's a very controlled environment and safe, and people will give you good um, feedback. And uh, Telegram is also where we receive a lot of that. We do AMAs with the community most of the time, but that's more answering their questions. Uh, I, I think allowing every type of interaction and having a team internally that can uh, build documents uh, with new questions or new ideas the whole time in real time and sharing that is important. So all of the co-founders and the development team, they are in the chat the whole time. So that we, we at least have two or three of us the whole time uh, get looking and listening. And we literally make decisions based on that. It's not just talk. We really, really do. We change priorities. We change products. We change offers. We change everything coming from there. Because it's a lot easier to do it this way than sitting with your team and trying to debate what's the best solution. The majority of the time, the best ideas come from directly the users of the product. So we dedicate a lot of our time in that process of gathering information and feedback from the users. Yeah, I I 100% agree that I, I think as marketers, it's very easy and, and common for us to think that we understand what the product needs and what needs to be prioritized and, and things like that when the customer is going to tell you and if you can create a system that gathers that and you know, create a, a, a feedback mechanism to actually act on it. Those are the companies that end up finding success. I'm, I'm waiting for the day and I'm sure it's not too far away. It might even exist already where some kind of AI powered bot or something like that can plug into an online community and kind of summarize the social sentiment of what people want, what people are unhappy about. Um, because the, the way you're doing it, as far as just kind of spending a bunch of time getting FaceTime, 
that's, in my opinion, the best way right now. But I think there's probably more scalable way of doing it in the near future with, you know, the, the kind of rise. Yeah, of this is definitely not scalable. But yeah. having a team trained to pick up these ideas really quickly and share really quickly with the decision makers, we can uh, almost in real time define uh, if this is implementable or not. And many times we have follow up questions and then we're able to use moderators to do follow up questions uh, on the community and uh, debate on ideas and the majority of it come from comes from this process. I would love to use AI if you ever hear of yeah. anything that could work. That would be great. But so far, we're mostly using our community uh, managers and and we're there too. In lieu of a robust technology solution existing, it's a lot of just kind of FaceTime with people I've found and just kind of not using your gut, but but it kind of is at the end of the day. When there's no, not a software that can help you kind of like process all this information and, and do something actual with it, it really just comes down to spending a bunch of time talking to people and training it so that your gut is like an educated one. We use our support team a lot. So we have a, a big support team in different languages because being able to hear the right people in different languages is also very important. So we have internal mechanisms with our support team to receive uh, weekly reports of everything that they heard and they received that could potentially be a good idea to make the product better. Uh, so our, our, our support team is today uh, one of the biggest uh, uh, pulses, uh, people who gather the polls with the market, right? So they are able to tell us a lot that you alone don't have any access to. So we use our support team, the community moderators, and we're also there. And we answer the majority of the impacts that we receive, whether it's email or uh, something from the website. We, we listen to that a lot because uh, we really, really, really take a lot of value and insights from what they bring. It's it's impressive that a technology company would sometimes listen to the research instead of listening to the clients because they solve your problems the majority of the time. It's it's crazy how when you put the pieces together, you really find solutions. Yeah, one of the things that I feel like a lot of, especially like engineering driven or code driven engineers that, that lead companies, it's very, very common. I'd say it's like like 75% of them will go ahead and spend like a year building a product and they think that they know what needs to be built and all this stuff where in my mind, I'm like, build the damn thing, launch it as, as shitty as it has to be, but make sure that you have a mechanism in place to get as much feedback as possible. Because what you think people want is by most odds, totally incorrect. We're not going to result in a you know a, a profitable business. So it's true. Yeah, it's. I think also if you have a community that's forgiving and will receive the product uh, in the basic stage, and if they know that they are able to pinpoint things and make it better, we are lucky enough that our community is like that. So the whole time they're bobbing us with with ideas, and they know that when we go first, it's better and then everything else that happens is a result of their interactions. And we also make sure to let them know uh, all of the time when a good idea comes, hey, we implemented this. Thank you for giving uh, that suggestion because that only fuels more and more activity in, in the community to bring more ideas because they see it's actionable, right? So yeah. I think that's important too. I don't know if this is specifically marketing, but I see it as it is because it's a way for you to connect with the existing uh, user base or clients today yeah i would consider you know it's community but community is part of marketing at least in the web3 space but it goes both ways because it helps you refine your product and it also energizes the community because they feel like they really have a say over the direction of, of what's being built where can listeners find you online and follow along in your journey they can uh find us at vivo.com vyvo.com that's our website and uh, there, there's a lot of information there they can find me on linkedin on uh, Discord, on uh, Vivo, uh, VSC, uh, Telegram channel, I mean, all of them, uh, sometimes with my own name, sometimes as the moderator, but you will always find me there. Okay, awesome. Well, it was really nice to have you on, and thanks. Thank you so much. It was really nice being here.